What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, um, some founders you've heard of and some you've never heard of. You know, Dave, you know, I had the founder of P90X, Tony Horton. And what I love about some of these stories is not the glory on the other side necessarily, but the trials and tribulations of the journey, right? We all know Tony Horton of P90X, he sold hundreds of millions of dollars of that stuff. but. What was fascinating for me is when he drove cross country when he was first starting out, he uh, made money as a street mime. So he actually was a street performer. That's how he made his food and apartment money. He put his head on the street and he would do street miming and that's how he made the money for food and rent. There's another person which no one, most people would never have heard of, Chris Atigeka, who um, was referred by a guest of the show and he was founder of two nonprofits and two for-profits. But what's interesting about Chris is he grew up in Uganda and at age seven, he became an orphan because both his parents died of AIDS and he was the oldest of five children. So he became head of the household mm. at age seven. And his, he was taking one of his brothers um, to the hospital and he died on the way to the hospital. Oh, yes. um, and he won a scholarship in the village to go to America and study. Um, and he ended up getting his PhD. He speaks nine languages. He got his PhD. While he was doing his PhD, he started a nonprofit, two nonprofits and two for-profits. It was, wow. it's, it's truly one of those stories that I think, you know, Dave, they're going to make a movie of it someday. And they're like, oh, half of this is not real, yet all of it will be real, you know? So and nine so... languages. I have a hard enough time with one. <laughs> Same with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so before I introduce today's guest, uh, Dave DeRocher, I just want to give a brief sponsor message. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners by helping you run your podcast. So we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. You know, because if it generates ROI, Dave, it's sustainable. Right. Same thing with the other side of academy. It's got to generate ROI so it's sustainable. And it was actually inspired by my grandfather, um, who was a Holocaust survivor. And he was the only person out of his family to survive the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, along with his brother. And um, the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him. And his legacy lives on. You can go to inspiredinsider.com, the about page. Um, where I have the full one hour interview talking about the atrocities that he went through. So Dave, I watch that multiple times a year just to have gratitude, appreciation um, for things in my life. I know you have, you have similar stories um, with you. So if you have questions about podcasting, I think every business should have a podcast hands down period. It's been the best thing I've done. I get to connect with amazing people like Dave um, and other people go to rise 25.com and check out more. Um, today's guest. I want to thank Joseph Grenny for referring to today's guest. And if you don't know Joseph Grenny's work, Vital Smarts, he also co-authored Crucial Conversations, which has sold over 4 million copies. Um, and today's guest is Dave DeRocher. He's the executive director at the Other Side Academy. Um, the Other Side Academy, I guess, Dave, you could say, saves lives by changing behavior. And to give a brief overview of Dave, um, he was arrested for the first time at age 13. By the time he was 38, he had been in prison four times for a total of 15 years. And he was facing 29 year prison sentence when he was given the option to go to Delancey Street and he was given a chance to change his life. And Dave was at Delancey Street for eight years, became the managing director of their 250 person Los Angeles facility and he helped launch the Other Side Academy in Utah. Dave, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. It's an honor to have been given the opportunity to do this with you. You know, um, you have a truly inspiring story. And, you know, people have a question of can someone change, right, is the question. Um, I don't know if you want to just talk about the moments leading up to having to make that decision. You know, your, what led up to that, I guess, you're facing the 29 years 
you know, I, I think things had gotten so bad for me having been a drug addict for 27 years and doing all of that time in prison that that's actually, it's like, like a hedonistic adaptation. I started to believe that prison is where I belonged. And I had spent a lot of years there. And then when I got out after my fourth prison term and got arrested again, it was a very ugly arrest, helicopters, high speed chase, it ended, ended in a pit maneuver, wanton disregard for public safety and the cops nearly beat me to the edge of my life. And I had every bit of it coming because of what I put them through. And when I finally went to, to jail and woke up in the infirmary and went through that whole process and went to court the first time and the offer was 29 years, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I had already done a two-year prison term, a five-year prison term, a six-year prison term, and a 10-year prison term. So I'm thinking to myself, I've already lived a large portion of my adult life in prison, and now I'm going to go and die there. So, you know, I fought my case for a long time in the county jail pre-sentence, and then finally I decided to write Delancey Street a letter. We, maybe we'll get to this part a little bit later in the interview, but I had written them before uh, my 10-year sentence, and they didn't accept me. And then I wrote them this time, and they interviewed me, and they didn't accept me. But it took a long time for the judge, uh, Judge Pacheco, to finally acquiesce and give me the opportunity to go. And he ended up suspending a 22-year prison sentence over my head. And, you know, for those people, and most listening probably have never faced that kind of time, it was almost a feeling of vertigo when you get really good news when I finally got accepted and the judge finally said I could go. I, I got that dizzy feeling like I had just gotten, you know, you would, when you get good news or bad news, you kind of get that dizzy feeling. I couldn't believe I was sitting in the cage all shackled and the judge said, I'm going to let you go against my better judgment. When you get kicked out or you split, I've got you for the rest of your life. I said, Your Honor, where do I sign? You know? You know, there's so much to unpack there and we will get to the rejection the first time around. But, um, you know, I'm trying to picture the scene, right? There's helicopters, there's police. What was it about that day or that time or with you that, you know, arresting someone, they don't typically need necessarily a chopper or something like that. What was it about unique about that situation at that time? I, all of my prison terms prior to that, uh, three of the four previous prison terms, I had loaded firearms, uh, usually a couple of them with me. So they knew that I was probably packing or, or had firearms on me. So the, on that particular day, when I got to a house in Huntington Beach and I looked out the window while I was going about my business, weighing dope, taking phone calls and getting ready to go out and make some deliveries, that helicopter was out there for a very long time. And usually the helicopters in the city are kind of floating around, just patrolling the city. This particular helicopter was really, really high in the sky. And it's ironic because I took Joseph and Tim, our CEO, back to that location two years ago. And we stood at that house and I pointed at the window to show them where I was looking out when it all happened. But a mm. couple hours went by and when I decided to leave the house, I wasn't really thinking much of it. You know, I didn't think they were there for me, but I, I got that weird feeling in my belly that they might be. And no sooner did I get in my car and drive away where there are cops everywhere. They weren't gonna go into the house to get me because the person who had told on me, I guess that was part of the deal that they had made. So they just waited for me to pull away. And there was multiple agencies, Huntington Beach Police Department, Anaheim, uh, parole, um, and I don't remember who else, but there was just a lot of, it was a very harried and hectic uh, uh, experience. And I had told myself previously, having done the four prison terms, that if I get busted again, I know I'm going back to prison for the rest of my life, so I'm not gonna stop. And there was a part in that high-speed chase on Atlantic and Magnolia that I was approaching a roadblock at that intersection, and I had a decision to make, stop and get arrested, or go through it and hope that they kill me. And Jeremy, I just kinda hunkered down in my car, took a deep breath, and just went through it and displaced the cars that were in the intersection and made the left-hand turn and that's when the cop closest to me did the pit maneuver and spun me out of control and shoved me up on an embankment. And, you know, as I look back on it now, I'm grateful that they didn't kill me. But at that time, that is really what I wanted to do because I didn't want to go back to prison and spend the rest of my life there. What are your thoughts now with the changing laws that marijuana is legal? Whew, that's a, you know, I, I think that marijuana obviously has... Uh, some value for those who need it for uh, medicinal purposes. 
But for me personally, and many people that I know, marijuana drinking and marijuana were the gateway drugs. I was drinking alcohol at a young age and smoking pot right around the same time. And pot led to Coke. And then one thing led to another. But it was a gateway drug for me. I think there's a, mm -hmm. there's a lot to unpack in that question because a lot of adults who start smoking pot at 30, 40, 50 years old probably aren't going to revert to methamphetamine or heroin as a result of it. But if kids do, that there's a huge difference between an adult doing it and children doing it. Once kids start smoking pot, it usually is the gateway drug to other stuff. So I think it's a, it's a bad idea as far as that's concerned. But, you know, for those who need it uh, medicinally, I, I, I get the value there yeah. as well. You know, Dave, I want to go back to this, you know, when I read it in the, the interview, for the first time you were arrested at 13. What was life like when you were, you know, 12, 13? Um, you know, my mom and dad are still married today. They've been married now for, I think, 57 years. And wow. Uh, it, it was it was bumpy. It was rocky in there for a while. And my dad was a, a drinker. And that's where I learned it. You know, he didn't teach me how to drink. But that's where I saw my dad drinking. And, you know, and it's amazing what happens when you're a kid, because you learn so much from your parents, just visually watching what they do, not so much in what they say. And I don't think we put enough emphasis on that. But my dad was verbally abusive, uh, at times physically abusive. And again, as a child at 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, that was the norm. I didn't know any better because that was the household I grew up in. And I think what ended up happening was I started to believe some of the things that he was saying as I was growing up that I was never going to amount to anything. He would use very mm -hmm. colorful vernacular at times. And now as I look back on it, that was the turning point for me that led me away from the good friends down another path with people that were, you know, drinking and smoking and doing all of those things. So my upbringing was decent, uh, besides the fact that I had that relationship with my dad. Um, and one thing just led to another, and I started to drink and, and, and smoke pot to kind of escape from how I felt. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, totally. Because um, I think, I don't know if you have a lesson or something for parents in general, um, at that time, you know, someone who's, um, you know, it's amazing what you said because kids just pick up on things. They do. You know, whether you say it or not, they just are like sponges. And yep. whether you say it or not, they are picking up on it. Yep. I've got a lot to say as it relates to that because, you know, I've got three boys of my own that I didn't raise because the lifestyle that I chose. So I know the damage that it does. But you know, it is so important. It is, it is just paramount. Parents get so busy these days. My mom and dad were both in aerospace, so they both worked full-time jobs, uh, oftentimes more than 40 hours a week. So I became a latchkey kid at a very young age. So I had a lot of freedoms and, uh, and that was not a good thing. And then, you know, parents come home from work, they got to cook dinner and they've got their own lives. And, you know, all of those things happen. And I don't think I got the attention that I needed I didn't realize at the time I wasn't getting the attention that I needed. And the attention that I did get was negative because I was like Dennis the Menace even before I started using. I was just that kind of a child. So as I look back on things now, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for parents to raise good kids because it is so much easier than fixing broken men. I think what happens in today's uh, world is the parents work, they come home, they cook dinner, they put the kids to bed, but they don't realize just how important it is to build those really strong, strong connections with their kids so the kids can confide in them and the things that they're going through and not feel judged or not feel like they can't share those, those, those things with their parents. And I think as I look back, that's where I was at. Did my parents love me? Yes. Did I love them? Yes. But did I feel comfortable going to my dad with the things I felt about the relationship that we were building or, or lack thereof? That's where I think I fell short, but I didn't know any better at that age. So it is very important to not just, uh, uh, to not just be there, but to be there. Yeah. You, know, you know, I want to get to, you know, when you were rejected by Delancey Street, but um, for people listening, is there a story, like I know that you, in your work that you do, you come across people who have been in prison many times, um, or maybe the first time, and I'm sure you've spoken to different groups. Is there a story you could tell from your, one of the prison experiences that, I don't want to say elicit fear in someone who's maybe listening and who's 
maybe going, starting to go down the wrong path um, and maybe hearing uh, one of the stories from your actual experience would, I don't know, scare them or correct them or whatever it is because they have to choose it themselves. But what's uh, like a, a story from being in prison that would, you know, kind of have that effect with someone? I think uh, prisons in California are probably different than most prisons in the country. California is unique in the sense that I, I refer to prison as, as high school with knives. You've got blacks, whites, Hispanics, basically fighting for control of the yard. The Northern Hispanics and the Southern Hispanics hate each other. The blacks and Hispanics and whites hate each other. It's a hate factory. So as soon as I got to jail uh, early on, I think it was 89 or 90, the LA County Jail, I was in a uh, cell block, I wanna say 9,500, and it was just a war zone. And I didn't know what bloods were, and I didn't know what crips were. And I remember standing there and four black guys roll up on me and say, we're just cripping. And the next thing I know, I'm fighting four people. And it didn't turn out well, and I did the best that I could. But that's when, the, that's when it started for me in jail. Then when I got to prison and I realized the prison politics in California are about as strong as anything you can imagine. There are so many rules and so many uh, things you can't or can't do. And if you break those rules in prison, you're gonna get stabbed, you're gonna get cut, and you're possibly gonna be killed. The rioting, the, the cell fights, all of them are bad. But I remember one riot in particular in, at Wasco State Prison on the four yard, which was a lifer yard right there in the day room where we literally just, us and the Hispanics fought for probably 10 minutes before the rest of the guards got in there. And it's deadly, very deadly, because you don't know who's got what. And there were times that I was in Jamestown uh, in California in prison where I had to cut somebody. It's, it's, it's do that or it's gonna be done to you. And that's kind of how you gain respect in prison is the amount of, uh, of violence you're willing to, to perpetrate. You know, are you going to be someone who lays down and does nothing? Or are you going to be somebody who stands up for your race and the cause and you're willing to hurt people? And, you know, you have a quick decision to make. And that was the decision I made at that time. And as I look back on it now, I'm, I'm disgusted with the, the way I lived. But I, I completely understand why I made the decisions that I did back then. Yeah. I mean, it's surviving. It, right. it is surviving. Espe you know, I want to emphasize that, especially in California. I think as you do research and you look at the California prisons compared to probably any other state, it is far worse in, in the state of California than anywhere else because of the prison politics, the racial divide. What are some other things you did to actually survive? Like, especially, you know, someone comes in there and maybe they're not violent, right? Maybe they have a drug offense. Um, they're not a violent person, but in order to survive, it sounds like you almost have to be. Yeah, you know, if you come into a prison in California and you're white, you have to obey by the rules inside the prison. So oftentimes, you know, on my second term, I became the, the guy with the keys or the shot caller of the yard. So I was the guy in charge of all the, the white people on that particular yard at that particular time. So I called the shots. If somebody came in and we pulled their paperwork, which means we were looking to see what their charges were to make sure they had no sex offenses, to make sure they weren't snitchers or rats. If we found out that someone came on the yard, then it was up to me to make sure that that person got handled uh, accordingly and rolled up off the yard. So it was, these were tough decisions to make, but that's kind of just the, the, the lifestyle I, I fell into while I was in prison. I, I wouldn't say fell into it. That's, those are the decisions I made. Does that, does that make sense, Jeremy? Yeah, totally. I'm just, it's, you know, it's, I could see how something like Delancey Street and the other side Academy, it's like you're in this environment of hate, right? How are you supposed to change when you're in an environment of, of hate? Yep. Well, I've, I've said it before and I'll, I'll say it again. Jails and prisons aren't, aren't, aren't conducive to change. They've never were designed to, and they're, they're never going to be. You can't change in jail or prison, even though there's programs in some jails and some prisons, you can't be accountable in there. Even if you're going to a program while you're incarcerated, you can't be accountable, what we call 200% accountability. If someone comes in and they're doing something wrong, you can't tell the cops that this guy's doing something wrong, even if you're in a program. Because if by chance you're in a pretty strong culture program, if you leave that program and go to another yard or another prison, that's going to follow you there and you're, going to, you're in danger. So it's almost impossible to change while you're incarcerated. It really is. It's hard to do. You need to be 
in an environment, in a, a community that's conducive to change for a long period of time to learn to do something different. So what do you mean by 200% accountability? 200% accountability for the Other Side Academy means I'm 100% accountable for me. As I was going through Delancey Street, if I did something wrong, to own it. Either if they asked me if I did it, to tell the truth, or if I did something wrong, to be accountable before I had to be asked. That's 100% accountable. Then to be accountable for your peers. If somebody in the program, either here at Delancey Street, did something wrong, to go let somebody know so that that person could get the help that they needed, which is the complete opposite of what you know, we learn on the streets or in jail and prison. That's what I was going to say. It seems like the exact opposite. But here's the thing. If, if I go to Delancey Street, having done all that time and been a drug addict for all those years, and I'm being sneaky and manipulating in Delancey Street, and people see me do it, and they don't tell on me, are they helping me or are they hurting me? They're yeah. hurting me. I'm not going to get the help that I need. And I'm acting the same way I did before I got there without the drugs and alcohol, which is why these programs work so well, because it's not about drugs and alcohol. It's about behaviors. So then if I see someone doing something wrong and I don't say something, I'm not being 200% accountable, 100% for me and 100% for them. I'm allowing them to do the same behaviors that got them in this trouble to begin with. I'm doing more damage than I am good. Dave, is there a daily practice? I know, and we'll get to the story a little bit, but you know, when you have that 200% accountability and you live that in that environment for four, five, six, eight, ten years, we still have habits. Do you still do you have something in your daily routine to help so that it, whether it's a thought or an action that basically shifts your mindset from okay, I never want to go back there or something, uh, something, something of that sort. I don't know that I have a daily routine, but mm -hmm. having, you know, if you've never been a drug addict and you've never gone to jail and you've never gone to prison, and let's just use Joseph Grenny as an example, what a, what a wonderful human being he is. Having never lived my lifestyle, it's hard for him to understand what it's like. And for me, having never lived his lifestyle while I was incarcerated, it's hard to understand what that's like. So I think when you've lived the life that I lived for as long as I lived it and then got to Delancey Street and took advantage of that opportunity, after about three and a half years, I realized that I could live my life today out there in the real world the same way I'm living it here. It took a few years for me to just come to that realization that I can do this now. But now every day that I wake up every day, I get to, I get to compare my life today, what a wonderful life I have, to that ugly one that I had. I can compare the yeah. two. Many people don't have that opportunity because they've lived their life the way they lived it. I imagine a lot like you lived yours, Jeremy, right? So until you yeah. can put the two side by side, so I, I, it's really easy for me. I go into jails, I go into prisons, I do presentations, I do interviews, all kinds of stuff. And every time I go back, I am reminded as I go through the vestibule and the gates close and the sounds, the smells, all of that. It's funny you ask that question because I don't ever have drug dreams anymore but I still have incarceration dreams. Every once in a while, I'm incarcerated again. I'm back in jail or I'm mm. back in prison and ugly stuff is happening and then I, you know, I wake up like, whew, you know? No drug dreams, hardly ever, but I still have incarceration dreams. That part is still, it's still in there. But to answer your question, that's kind of how I do it. I just compare my life today to my life 15 years ago and it's a no-brainer. I don't ever want to go back to that again and it has nothing to do with drugs. It has to do with compromise. Do I do the right thing every single day, every opportunity for the right reasons? Do not compromise. Once you start down that slippery slope, it's very difficult to return around and get traction again. You know, I encourage, Dave, everyone to watch your TEDx talk that you gave. Um, it's pretty remarkable. And one piece struck me where you said, you know, I'm standing here and I would have 11 years left on my sentence, I think, at the point where you gave that talk. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was, it was funny. We were just having this conversation the other day. If I would have gotten the 22 years, which is what I asked for, that's what I had coming, uh, if I wasn't given the opportunity to go to Delancey Street, I would still be in prison today. And because the way I live my life in prison – being a shot caller, being the guy in charge on the yards, being a violent offender, and doing the things that I chose to do on the inside, I don't know if I ever would have came home. Maybe my 85% would have been done of the 22 years and I would have gotten out at 18 or 19 years, 
but Lord only knows how much more time I would have picked up while I was incarcerated. Yeah. How did you meet Joseph? So let's see how I can, uh, Joseph Granny wrote a book called The Influencer. In that book, The Influencer, one of the chapters features Mimi Silbert, the president of Delancey Street. So 14, 15 years ago when he was writing that book, he interviewed Mimi Silbert. And at that point he realized, this is a wonderful model. Delancey Street's got the cure for cancer, but they're not spreading it. They're not uh, 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 opening up other facilities. They hadn't in many, many years. And I think that planted the seed for him. Then a couple yeah. of his kids, he probably shared the story, got into drugs themselves, and he quickly realized he needed to do something like this in Utah. So him and his cadre of colleagues and friends got together, went to Delancey Street in San Francisco. I was already gone. They did the two-day replication training, and they left that replication training knowing, yes, we can do it, but we can't do it. We can do it, but we can't be the ones running it. So they yeah. quickly started to do a search, and they came across uh, – uh, God, I'm having a, a brain fart. Um, uh, Charlotte Harper, I'm sorry, Charlotte Harper, who was in Delancey Street for 38 years. And they found her on LinkedIn and they reached out to her and said, listen, this is what we want to do. Charlotte and I were in contact. She called me and she says, listen, Dave, I'm about ready to go to Utah this Friday to meet a couple guys who want to do a replication. I'm like, really, seriously, Charlotte, uh, other people want to do this? You know, who are they? She says, I'm not sure. But if they're not- Why were you so skeptical? Because people that don't come from this background can't do it by themselves. The average mm. Joe, the layman, is not gonna be able to start a therapeutic community and know how to deal with this population until you've been through it. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, Cause you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. he said, I'm gonna travel out there this Friday. If they're not crazy, is this something you'd be interested in? I said, absolutely. But they've gotta be crazy. They can't wanna, there's just no way around it. And uh, that Friday, she came out and she met Joseph and Tim. Uh, and that Saturday we spoke, she said, Dave, they're not crazy. I go, really, Charlotte, you think they've got what it takes? She says, I do. And I told them about you. I guess what she said to them was, I know one guy who can help you get this started. She says, do you want to meet him? I says, I do. And a week or two later, Tim and Joseph flew to Los Angeles. We met at LA Live, uh, that area of Los Angeles at uh, Fleming's Steakhouse. And uh, had about a two or three hour dinner meeting. And when we sat down before the meeting ever started, I said, gentlemen, don't say a word. Who are you? First, let me ask questions. Who are you? What is the genesis of thought behind this? What makes you think you can and why in the hell would you want to? And Joseph spoke mm -hmm. for the first 20 minutes and told me his story. Then Tim spoke and I knew I was in the presence of great men. And when we were done with that meeting, that was the only one we needed. And that's how we wow. met. And so at what point do you then launch the Other Side Academy? I think we met in March of 2015, not long after they came to Los Angeles to meet me. I flew to Utah and met with them. We had a big meeting at Vital Smarts with a lot of people that peppered me with a lot of questions. It was a, a long, long meeting. And then we just kind of went around the Wasatch Valley and they showed me the state. And Tim spent a lot of time with me showing me all the different you know, uh, BYU and the U, and we looked at some properties, and I flew back and forth a few times, and then we landed on the, the current property that I'm sitting in now, and we made the purchase in September of 2015. Me and some other uh, uh, colleagues that I brought from Delancey Street moved in, and we got started. It's a big undertaking, Dave. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Um, I want to go back to you applied to Delancey Street and you got rejected. Yeah. And why? Um, so it, it's, it's a fascinating how it all went. I didn't know at the time what the requirements were, what they weren't. I just remember getting interviewed before my 10 year prison sentence. I didn't know what my sentence was going to be because at that time it was 20 years and I ended up hiring a lawyer. We got it down to 10 and I pled out. But while I was fighting my case, I wrote Delancey Street, they interviewed me and they did not accept me. So I get a letter of non-acceptance saying no bed space. That's all I knew. I go and I do my prison sentence, my fourth term. I get out, get busted again in the high speed chase, go back to jail, rewrite Delancey Street again. This time they do accept me. Now I still don't know why they didn't the first time and why they did the second time. Completely different interviewers, many years apart. 
But then about two and a half years into my stay at Delancey Street, when I became an interviewer, I realized why. In that first interview, all I talked about was the guns, the drugs, the women, the mayhem, the chaos, who I thought I was, and that's all I talked about. Well, that interviewer saw right through me and left me right where I belonged. I, Jeremy, if he'd have accepted me, I wouldn't be sitting here today. The fact that he left me in jail helped save my life because I wouldn't have stayed in Delancey Street. I wasn't ready to change. All I wanted to do was tell him what a big drug dealer, gang member, not gang member, but you know, gangster lifestyle. So he read right through it and realized I wasn't ready, and he was right. In the second interview, many years later, uh, I remember him asking me questions about my family, my, my kids, my lifestyle, and I remember at the end of that interview, we're knocking on that glass with my handcuffs on, with tears running down my face, begging him for an opportunity. He did accept me. So that was the difference between the two. The first time, I never even asked for help. The second time, I was begging for it. You know, talk about um, what the Other Side Academy is for people who don't know, and maybe walk us through from, okay, now they accepted you. What's next? So the Other Side Academy is a two and a half year re-education facility for the most lost among us. Our average student has been arrested over 25 times. We have a small cadre of people that have never been arrested. When I say small, a couple, two or three, and many who have been arrested 30 or 40 times. So it's the long-term drug addict coupled with the criminal behavior. So two and a half years long, two years residential, six years post-grad, you can stay longer. The difference between us and your 30, 60, 90 days model is it's not about drugs. And here, it's about behaviors. Because all drug addicts, there are no exceptions, Jeremy. We become liars and cheaters and thieves and manipulators and self-centered, self-seeking people that don't care about anybody, including ourselves. We just become completely broken and so self-consumed, so selfish, that it's very difficult uh, patterns to break. So at the Other Side Academy, if you come in and take a seat on our bench and we interview you and we accept you, you start that day. If you write us a letter from the county jail, pre-sentence, and we interview you, and you get a letter of acceptance, and the judge sends you here, you start that day. It is completely free. We charge nobody anything. We take no money from the city, the county, the state, the federal government, uh, Medicaid, insurance. More importantly, rich mommy and daddy can't come in and write a $200,000 a check and say, fix my son or daughter. We take nothing. We generate all of our own revenue through our social enterprises, which is where the magic happens. Because then when the student gets here, I don't know if you can see me doing this, I'm kicking my feet up on my desk. We don't sit around mm -hmm. on a couch while some therapist is therapizing us. We get up mm -hmm. every day, we go to work, and we work our butts off until we learn to have a, a monster work ethic. And all of those behaviors that led us to the Other Side Academy are going to come out in our daily routine. Work is the Petri dish for the behaviors. So we're a long-term therapeutic community, pe completely peer-driven, and it's free. And here's the other important part. I cannot emphasize this enough. 30-day model, 60-day model, 90-day model. In most cases, you have to leave on day 30, 60, or 90. And why is that? Because the money's run out. Know. You uh. have to leave because the insurance has run out, the state funding has run out, rich mommy and daddy are broke. There's no money left, so you have to leave. And it doesn't matter whether you're ready or not. You have to leave. So you can tell your counselor, no, I'm not ready to go. I'm going to go out and reoffend. I'm going to go use again. Doesn't matter, Mr. DeRocher, you have to leave. But I'm going to reoffend. You have to leave. We need the bed space for funding. Where most programs are built around a funding model, we are built around a helping model. You can stay at the Other Side Academy as long as you want to, as long as you are a contributing member in this community. You are positive, you are helping others, and you are making progress. That, Jeremy, is where the magic happens because then you graduate when you know in your belly that you're ready to reintegrate back into the community and become a productive member, not because a particular day came around. People leave programs for one of two reasons, because they have to or because they can. When you're in a, in a community like this where you can stay as long as you need to, then you get to leave when you're ready. That's the difference. Talk about the social enterprises, Dave, for people who don't know, what kind of businesses? So we've got 
Uh, we've got a number of social enterprises. Some are, are revenue generating, some aren't. Food service, we cook for 110 people roughly with students and staff, three meals a day, seven days a week. So you've got food service that doesn't generate revenue, but is ancillary and supportive of those that do. You've got corporate development, which is a team of people because we're a 501c3, a nonprofit that are downstairs calling businesses all over the country, but primarily in Utah, asking for donations, clothing, tools, uh, food, whatever we might need to offset our, our expenses so we don't spend all of our money on those things, we can get them donated. Then we have construction, on-site construction, taking care of all of our properties. And I've just recently, in the last few months, actually launched the other side builders, is I think what we're going to call it. And now we're doing off-site construction projects, also generating revenue. But you've got food right. service, corporate development, legal and finance. But the generating, uh, the social enterprises that generate the revenue are the moving company and our thrift stores. Our moving company, we do about 250 to 300 moves a month. We generated $2.4 million last year on our moving company. And bear in mind, Jeremy, how many times have our students been arrested on average? Like 15, 10? 25 times. So 25. This, is the, this is the same population that used to take your goods out your window. Now they wrap it up, <laughs> tag it, deliver it to the other side, and it all gets there. We are the number one rated moving company in the entire state of Utah. Number one mm -hmm. with this population. So while we were doing that, we were taking a lot of donations. Couch here, dining room table here, bedroom set here. And I had some shipping containers in the back of the property. And we were filling these shipping containers up with all this furniture that I really didn't know what we were going to do with. And then about three and a half years ago, we did a couple of yard sales because we've got a pretty big parking lot and made a couple thousand dollars one weekend, a couple thousand the next weekend, and we all got together and said, we need to open a thrift store. People in mm. Utah told us, you can't do that. We said, why? They said, because there's DIs here, Deseret Industries, which is the, uh, uh, the Mormon church sponsored thrift stores. And we said, what oh. do you mean we can't? What do you mean we can't? What's next door to McDonald's? Burger King. Next door to Burger King? Pizza Hut. Don't tell us we can't open a thrift store because there's Goodwill or DI. Of course we can. And we opened one up right next to a DI. And everything we won't sell in our store, we donate to them. But when you want the other side thrift boutique, you're going to walk in, you're going to look around, you're going to turn around, go back outside and look at the sign because you're going to think you went into Nordstrom's. It's that nice. Mm -hmm. Upscale thrift store, top-notch customer service, completely ran by the students, so those two social enterprises, the moving company and the thrift stores, generate the lion's share of our revenue, and the students operate them and run them. So they're learning valuable hard skills and soft skills simultaneously, which is real life. Go to other programs, you're there for 30, 60, 90 days, you're sitting around while somebody's paying $30,000 a month for you to be there, and you're not learning anything you didn't already know. So the social enterprise... Yeah, they I'm sorry. Yeah, you you mentioned, um, you know, right now you have a reputation and it's well rated early on when you first started. No one knew you. Just like you said, the same people who are taking it out the window, you know, are now in your house. How do you sell those initial customers on using your service? You know, we would, I actually started the moving company and I, believe me, it's a young man's job. It, it beat me up. I'm 53 years old now, but five years, almost five years ago when we started, I had done a lot of moves while I was at Delancey Street. So I kind of knew already what to do. We just needed a couple of customers to, to have some faith in us and allow us to do it. And then we got really lucky. A very prominent radio show host here, Doug Wright, uh, announced on radio that he was getting ready to move. Him and his wife bought a new home. And I think it was Joseph or Tim that reached out to him and asked him if he would allow us to do it. And we did. And we videoed it. He put it on air and it just blew up. And then we do a lot of advertising on, on Yelp, uh, uh, Home Advisor, uh, and a yeah. number of other social sites. And, you know, we just kept building on it. And, you know, when you have hundreds of five-star reviews, it, it's just, it feeds on itself now. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite quotes when I was uh, talking to, to Joseph and interviewing him and he told the story about the the radio host and I said Joseph you had a line I think is one of my favorite lines of all time 
Um, and he said the guy when he approached the person to actually do the move, and the person said, you know, yeah, I'll do it. And then he's like, well, you know, here's the program. He's like, I don't know. It's my family, Joseph. I don't know. And he said, um, you know, the difference is the other moving companies have ex-convicts. We're just upfront about it. And we have a cause about it. Right. Not just that, so, but not just that, Jeremy, but have you ever met anybody while you were going to high school or going to college that said, man, Jeremy, congratulations on graduating. I can't wait. I'm going to go be a mover. Nobody wants to be a mover. <laughs> you fall into those positions by default. Right. You can't pass the postal exam or you're a drug addict. You've got, or you're crazy, one of the three, because nobody wants to be a mover. So today, if you hire a moving company, odds are you're going to get somebody that has a little something illegal in that little pocket of his jeans, probably has a beer in the cooler. He's probably on the phone talking to his drug addict girlfriend while you're paying him $50 an hour. All of those things are happening simultaneously while he's on your move. The difference is you get that same population, only they've come out the other side. They're clean, they're sober, they're not on the phones, they're not drinking, they didn't get high the night before. So it's the same population, just the changed version. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the values um, of the other side academy because they mimic the values of, and we were talking with Joseph about this, some of the biggest companies in the world and even investment capital companies. One of them is feedback. And you talk about in your TEDx talk about taking a, getting a haircut, right? So I wonder if you could share a few um, times of feedback where you were given just raw feedback and also where you actually had to give someone raw feedback? Um, if, if you come to an organization like this and you don't make feedback your best friend, you're in trouble. It is impossible to change unless you listen to people tell you, and it's not an attack on the person, it's an attack on the behavior. I was in Delancey Street. I wasn't there for very long. And there was a, uh, uh, the big club area, the common meeting area. Then there was a little hallway with a couch set up and it overlooked the windows out on the veranda and smokers would be out there smoking cigarettes. And I was standing in front of the couch with my back to the windows. And there was five or six guys sitting on that couch, all white guys from Orange County. And I was talking to them and I didn't realize how that looked at the time. So someone walked by, saw me addressing them and they gave me a pull up. Dave, what are you doing? You guys need to mix it up. I took offense to it. I didn't like the pull up. I sniped back. I said what I wanted to say to him. Like, don't, don't you talk to me like that. Do you know, you, don't you know who you think you're talking to? You know, that kind of thing. An hour later, they pull me out of my job and they take me in the uh, Vatican and they blasted me. They blasted me, not just because I didn't take my pull up and just say, okay, but the optics of it. Here's me having lived that lifestyle, standing there addressing five or six white guys. It looked like a prison yard meeting and it clicked like, my goodness, they're right. That probably is how it looked. And I was doing the very thing there that I had done previously and I got blasted for it. Uh, one of the other worst haircuts I got at the beginning was you're never allowed to talk about your past while you're at Delancey Street or here. And one of my quote unquote homeboys showed up because I knew so many people in Delancey Street. And he showed up and I asked him how a previous uh, crime partner was. And uh, I heard about that too. And I got blasted for that, got four hours of uh, community service. And I got put on that big window. And for four hours, all I could do was stand there at that window and wipe windows while everybody saw me there. And then I got the game played with me for it for a number of weeks about my behavior, about my uh, inability to take a pull up. So it's really critical that 200% that accountability, it's critical to take the feedback. And my goodness, when you live the lifestyle I did, if you don't listen to people as they're telling you about how you're acting, why are you even there? What's your advice for people taking feedback? You know, at that point, again, you're used to, you don't need to answer to anyone, you know, um, previous to this. You know, people- how, What's your advice for people taking hard feedback? Yeah, people come here and they're afraid of feedback. And I go, let me see if I've got this straight. You've been to jail 28 times. You'd like to think of yourself as a hardened criminal. You're willing to break into people's homes. You're willing to hurt people. You're willing to be violent. You're willing to deal, whatever it is. You're willing to do all that and you can't sit in a game setting while someone tells you about yourself. 
Oh my Lord, you gotta be kidding me. And 99% of the time it's because of the lack of humility, which translates the opposite, pride. So I tell them when they get here, let me see if I've got this straight, Jeremy, a guy who's been arrested 28 times, been to prison four times. You're sitting here telling me you're having a hard time with feedback. You didn't graduate high school. You didn't raise your kids. You kicked them down the street for other people to raise. You've been in and out of jail and prison your whole adult life. You don't, don't own your own business. You have nothing to speak of. What the hell are you so proud of? Make me understand. Maybe I'm wrong. Make me understand why you're so full of pride. Because it's the false pride. It's what the guys do. What you're willing to do in jail, what you're willing to do in prison, fills you with all that false pride. But truth be told, Jeremy, it takes a coward to do the things I did in jail and prison. It takes a real man to do what we're doing today. To be open, mm. to be honest, to be vulnerable, to build real true connections. Yeah. That's the difference. That's so once, you, people. once you reflect back on people's paths in their lives, does the light bulb typically click on or does it take more than that? You know, you, you'll see a lot of what I refer to as aha moments uh, in a mm -hmm. person's day. And usually if they, if they can get rid of that false pride and be uh, more open to feedback, you know, it's different for everybody. Some people you can talk to them just like this, have a, just a heart to heart conversation. Other people, you need to raise the volume a little bit and really get in their Southern exposure. It just depends on who it is. And I think the art is learning to, to, to get to know your students and how mm -hmm. to get through to them. But you'll see somebody in their stay, if they truly are here for the right reasons and they do want to change, have many aha moments as you break through and peel back those layers uh, of the onion, if, if you will. Yeah, I remember watching you, uh, I can only see it one-sided, you conducting an interview and basically reflecting back on, I don't know if you remember this, about um, the person who basically said they cared for their family. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So what, what did you say to them? I, I, uh, I, was just, I just did an interview earlier today, right? And I was talking to somebody on the phone and I said, Do you have kids? And he said, Yeah. I said, how many? He says, two. I says, what are their names? And he gave me both names. I go, how old are, how old are they? He said, uh, 10 and 7. I says, do you love them? He says, with, with everything in the world, I love my kids. Let me see if I've got this straight. You're calling me from jail. You're on your way to prison for the fifth time. You just told me you love your kids. How in the hell would you treat them if you hated them? And there was dead yeah. silence on the phone. You use the word love. You haven't seen your oldest in eight years. Make me understand in the last eight years where you've shown them that you love them. The reason why you say you love your kids is because it makes it easy for you to sleep at night. But love is not a word. Love is an action. Where have you showed them that you do? Because you basically kicked them down the street for other people to raise while you chase women and drugs. And he was silent on the phone and he goes, wow, I've never heard it put to me like that before. I said, you're pathetic. You said you love people that you hurt. If that's what your definition of love, either you are a, you have no idea what the word means or you're a sociopath. Which one is it? Well, Dave, I'd like to think that I don't know the definition of love because I don't think I'm a sociopath. I said, listen, I believe you want to love your kids. Most people do, but you have no idea how to because you don't know how to love you. And if you can't love you, how in the hell are you going to love anybody else? And the interview was, it was a powerful interview. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, you know, being an interview has got to be a really, really tough job because you probably want to help everyone, mm -hmm. but not everyone wants help. Yep. How is it, do you deal with that? You know, this person needs it, yet you have to reject them based on what they're saying and how they're acting. You know, we, there's, there's only a few hard stops in an interview. If you've ever had any sex offenses at all, whether you have to register or not register, if you have those kinds of charges, we can't take you. If you've got arson, we can't take you. And if you require psychotropic medication, and most of our students have been on anxiety, uh, medications for anxiety or depression or PTSD, 
any number of things like that. And, you know, Jeremy, who hasn't been diagnosed with ADHD since 1980? Everybody. <laughs> and, 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 and the doctors, you know what I mean? And the doctors are yeah. creating drug addicts because what happens is you put them on these medications, then they don't get the opportunity to learn to deal with their emotions, which means they're going to go back to their use again. So we understand that drug addicts, when you're out there running the streets, are going to have anxiety. You're stealing from people and running from the law. Then you get busted. Of course you're depressed. Welcome to life. But putting them on medications is a bad thing. So to get to your question, um, I, I got sidetracked on that. Uh, it's really, it's just really must be hard when you get, so like you are mentioning, there's some hard stops, like we can't accept you. But past that, it's got to be tough if you, you know this person's going to get help and you still have to be, tell them, you know, this is yeah. not a fit right now. I, I think if they don't have the hard stops, if they don't have those things in their, in their history, and they can get through the interview. I've got people in interviews that don't show any remorse at all. They've, they've gotten so cold over the years and kind of closed up that I get that part too. This is a perfect place for people like that. And others who just break down crying because they're so emotional and then everything in between. But if you can get through the interview and you don't have any hard stops and there's no red flags, odds are we're going to accept you. So usually yeah. when I have to say no, it's because of a medical condition or some of the uh, 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 other red flags that we just can't take. Yeah. But there was one case, you know, you got rejected, right? Yep. And then another one, I remember you telling a story, I think it was in the TEDx, where you, really, you had to reject someone and what happened after that? I did. At the very beginning, when we first started, we were very careful about who we brought in so we could get the culture started uh, on the right foot. And the gentleman's name was Leo. And it's a fascinating yeah. story. Me and my friend at that time, Alan, were at a mall buying a birthday present for a friend of ours. We walk out of the mall and in Salt Lake City at City Creek, you have to go across the tracks to get into the second half of the mall. We see a guy sitting on the sidewalk. His face is picked up. He's got all kinds of scars. He's sitting there with a cup. He's panhandling with his dog. Fast forward four or five days later, there's a guy sitting on our bench. I walk by, I look at the guy on the bench, and I thought, Where? I just saw him a few days ago. I bring Alan into the room, and I go, remember a couple days ago when we were at the mall, and I explained the situation? He goes, yeah. I go, that's him on the bench. So oddly enough, it was him. We bring him in, and we do his interview, and he is a pompous arrogant ass. Can I say that on, on air? You could, yes, definitely. <laughs> That's, he was a pompous, pompous, arrogant ass, and he wasn't taking the interview seriously. So I told him no, sent him on his way, and he walked out our front door, came around the facility, and unfortunately, you can't see it now, and he literally came out here, and I don't know how well you can see, but there's a little tiny step out there near the street. Mm -hmm, and he's, mm -hmm, yep, yep. He sat on that step for a good 10 minutes. And then he got back up and he came around to the front door and he knocked on the door and I opened it up mm. and, he, and he was in tears. And he said, Dave, I OD'd last night. If you guys don't take me, I'm going to die. Please give me a shot. Just that line alone was different than his entire interview. He must have went out there, sat down, realized that he blew it, came back around, came in, sat down, I interviewed him and took him. It was just yeah. it was one of those interviews that I'll never forget. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, you mentioned some of the values, right? Feedback, 200%. Yep. Humility. Um, yep. I don't know if you want to, what's your, your, I don't know, favorite story about humility is a good way of putting it, but um, there's, I know there's stories about Jimmy, um, but I don't know what sticks out to you as a good story, whether it was with you or for someone else when they really got the humility part. I think I didn't realize how bad I had it when I got to Delancey Street. And, you know, I get to Delancey Street and I'm fortunate to even go because for a long time in the county jail fighting my case, the judge said, no, Mr. Drosher, you know, it went from 29 down to 22 after a number of months, some of the ancillary charges had fallen off. He said, you're getting 22 years. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. But when I finally uh, convinced him, because I wrote him a letter four pages long, front and back, and finally convinced him to give me the shot. When I got to Delancey Street, I thought I was humble. 
that was nothing farther from the truth. The minute I got called off of maintenance to a regular full-time job in landscaping, like here we have a number of social enterprises that don't generate revenue, landscaping was one of them there. So they stuffed me in the backyard. I was beside myself, Jeremy. I hated it. I wanted it. I, I, what I referred to as bled all over the house. I complained and moaned and bitched. And to whoever would listen, don't they know who I am? They're wasting me in the backyard. And I was mad because I thought that I had something coming. I just beat a 22 year prison sentence. And Jimmy Jones used to walk that dog down there. He'd stand at that veranda that I was sharing with you earlier where the smokers would sit. Well, down below there is where the grassy area is at. He'd send his dog down there every morning to poop in that grassy area. And it drove me nuts. I wanted to run up there and beat him with that rake or the shovel, whatever I was using, and drop kick his dog onto the 101 freeway because that's where we were at in Southern California, right off the 101. And it took me a long time until I just finally became okay with it and realized, what am I even complaining about? I should be in prison. And it took a long time for me to come to that realization that it's not all about me. I already got what I asked for. I got the opportunity. And funny thing is, if in that interview, if they would have said, Mr. DeRocher, we're going to take you. You're going to get out from underneath your prison sentence, but we're going to put you in landscaping for, for the two years. I just said, what do I sign? But the minute you get there, like all drug addicts, it's never good it's enough. It's a new normal. We want it now. It's so a new normal at that point. Yeah. I'm sorry? It's a new normal, I guess. Yes. You just get accustomed to that. Yeah. And in prison or in jail or on the streets, if I didn't get what I wanted, I took what I wanted. Now I'm in Delancey Street, and that isn't working. It just wasn't working. I had to learn to take a back seat and, uh, and just be okay with stuff and just learn to be okay. Yeah. And that took some time. Dave, what's been um, also uh, a story that you, you know, from someone else that you remember the transformation, when, how they came to the other side academy to the present? Um, we have, a, we have a staff member here now by the name of Jordan. And his story was not unlike my own. He didn't do as much time, but he did a considerable amount of time. And he did, had been to prison three times, drug dealer, uh, you know, that guy out there just creating havoc, a lot like my own story. And I interviewed him over the phone and I accepted him. And I went and picked him up at Davis County Jail and I brought him home. And he was very manipulating, very articulate, very sneaky. And when he started to get some freedoms and he would leave the house, you never get to leave the house by yourself. You have to leave with other people. He would go to the gas station and he would convince the people he was with to go in and use the phone so he could call his girlfriend. We found out about it. He got a contract, which means he got in trouble, did a two week contract, and then had to earn the right back to have some freedoms again. Then he did it a second time. So now he's been with us for about a year. Now he got a second contract for the same offense using the phone to call the girlfriend. And the guy, you know, we think calling our girl, you know, just so you can hear them answer the phone so that you can hear them say, I love you. But you know darn well what they're out there doing while you're here. But that's just how we are. So he does a second contract. And then about 18 months, he does it a third time. And at that point, he's getting close to his, the end of his stay and I have a decision to make. So I confer with my colleagues and decide I'm going to walk him out, kick him out of the other side academy, bring him back in, set him on the bench and re-interview him if that's what he wants to do. If he doesn't want to do that, good luck. Go back to court, go back to prison. So I brought him in the quorum, explained what we were going to do, that I'm going to walk you out, I'm kicking you out, bringing you back in. And it was a risky thing at the time to do because he could have opted not to. He said, nope, that's it, I'm gone. But he knew that if he went back before the judge, before he finished his two years, that he was going back to prison. So he stayed. Not only did he stay and complete the first two years, but we started him over. So he had to completely start over. And he stayed another mm. two years. And just uh, four or five months ago, we hired him as a full-time employee. And mm. he literally runs my uh, construction department and my construction company. And he is a completely different person. So for many years of jail and prison, to being sneaky and manipulating and making it all about him, to walking out, starting over, coming back, doing his stay all over again, to now a full-time staff member. Yeah, and that's kind of what you said earlier about the compromise, right? Because yeah. to some people, it's no, call your girlfriend, no big deal. But that little compromise is a, is a slippery slope. Yeah, I, I call it cancer. Now, there's, 
everybody knows the difference between right and wrong. You do, I do, most of society knows the difference between right and wrong. We get to choose every day in all of our daily dealings, you know, what we're gonna do. Um, there's never any excuse, and there's a difference between making a mistake and making a conscious decision to do the wrong thing. If I forget to set my alarm and, you know, at night, I wake up in the morning late, I'm like, ah, you know, if I'm driving down the street, having a conversation with the person I'm driving with and I run the yellow or red light, those are mistakes. But when you make a conscious decision to do the wrong thing and you know it's the wrong thing, that's completely different. Those are some of the things we really key in on here at the Other Side Academy is making good, sound decisions every single day, no matter what. And when you start to compromise here, you don't have drugs and alcohol to blame it on. And let's just say you're late to work, nobody notices, and you don't, and you're not 200% accountable. You've got the cancer. Then you take an extra cookie when you're not supposed to. There's your cancer. You've got all these little things adding up, adding up, adding up. Now you've got a dozen little things you've done wrong and you haven't been accountable for it. Then boom, stage four, metastatic cancer. You do something big and your life blows up. So it's really important that people understand never compromise. I don't care how big it is. Do the right thing every single day for the right reasons, no matter what. Get in the practice of doing that and your life will change. Yeah, Dave, thanks for sharing that because it is a slippery slope. Um, what other values? We mentioned humility, feedback. What are some other values of the Other Side Academy? You know, I, there's three that, I, that really stand true for me. It's honesty, mm -hmm. uh, accountability, and integrity. Being honest impeccably no matter what. It doesn't matter what it is. Just be honest. Accountability. Uh, being accountable if you've done something wrong. Being accountable if you haven't done something wrong and you know others have. Just being impeccably accountable. And the sum of those two things is integrity. And Jeremy, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't, nothing else matters. You either have it or you don't. And if you're a drug addict and you don't have integrity, you're going back. Because you're gonna leave this community back into the, uh, the mainstream community where the pressures are much greater and there's a, you know, life is difficult. And if you don't learn integrity while you're here, you're going to go back out there and still make the same mistakes you did before. And you're going to use again, invariably every time. Yeah. So honesty, first of all, and integrity. Yeah. First of all, Dave, I want to, I have one, two last questions and I just want to thank you for your time and sharing these really powerful, inspiring stories. Um, and everyone should check out the Other Side Academy. Um, whether you're in Utah, or you're outside of Utah, there's a lot of leadership and live by principles, obviously. Um, I always ask Dave, since this inspired insider, one, what's been a low moment that you had to push through? And then on the other side, what's been an especially proud moment that you think back on? Uh, a low moment since I've been at the Other Side Academy? In general. Whew. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think, uh, I think that one of the most difficult things since I've been here has been in my own personal life with my kids. Um, I, I've got three boys, ages 30 to 35, and there was a 20-year window where I was non-existent. I wasn't there. And while I was in Delancey Street, I was there for about five years when my oldest boy popped in and I didn't know he was coming. And some of my colleagues, my peers there came into my office and said, Dave, your son's here. I said, excuse me? Well, I've got three. Who? And they said, Christopher. And Jeremy, he, I, I came out and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And 20 years had gone by. No letters, no phone calls, no contact, nothing. And we went into a room and he played the game with me for two hours, calling me every kind of uh, expletive you could imagine and 90 percent of what he was said was accurate the other 10 percent wasn't but it didn't matter so I sat there and I let him tell me how he felt about me and all the things he opine about you know what he needed to, 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 to say and uh, slowly over the years I've been able to put these relationships back together with all three of my boys but there's been some trying times where I'm gone for all this time and you know they're reaching out and they're asking for money and they're asking for this and that's not how we fix this relationship. 
you know, I realize I was gone, but I have very firm boundaries today. And if you're not living a lifestyle that's conducive to a good lifestyle, don't ask me to bail you out. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to parent you on guilt or remorse. I'm going to parent you on principles. And if that's not good enough for you, then we don't have a relationship going forward. And it's worked, but it's been difficult trying to strike that balance. And now I'm in a relationship and I'm getting married in August. And the woman I'm marrying in August has a 17-year-old daughter. And I love her. I, I, I seriously do. And she's a wonderful young lady. But she's difficult. She's entitled. She's spoiled. Um, mm -hmm. All of those things because her mom. Teenage was, girl. Good luck, Dave. Yeah. That's it. You, you, you served X number of prison sentences and gone through all this. And now you have a teenage daughter. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Old and, but, yeah. It, it, it's been a challenge. Those two things have been the most challenging, I think. Doing this kind of work, uh, I've seen people come and people go, and that's always difficult, but there really hasn't been a low point for me, Jeremy, a point where I was like, just, I, I can't do this. I, this is in my, it's in my DNA. I love this, this work. I love this mission. You know, it's just, yeah. I, there's nothing else I'd rather do. And then what about, uh, as far as the flip side, a uh, especially proud moment? For you, um, it could be you or uh, one of the one of the uh, people at the other side academy. I think you know the TED talk was in, was was interesting. I didn't even realize what TED talks were when I was. I didn't apply for it. They approached me and asked me to do it, and that was mm -hmm. a a very. I do a lot of presentations and a lot of speaking engagements all over the country, and very seldom do I have to memorize something. So that was a very trying you know it's, it's it's 18 minutes of memorization and my brain doesn't work that well anymore and so that was a really it was a really cool experience for me but more important than that was the number of people that have watched it and who've come to the other side academy because mom and dad saw the ted talk and i knew doing it that that was my mission and my goal that if i do this i just hope that other people find their way here and countless people have found their way here because they've seen the ted talk and that makes it so worthwhile and I think some of the high points uh, aside from that are was getting to the two year mark where our first cadre of students started to graduate. The first two years, it's difficult because you don't have anything coming out the, uh, the graduating pipeline. You have people that are still here and you have people that leave. So it takes a while for, this, for it to really start working. And I, I think watching our graduates graduate, go out there and live successful lives, there's no better feeling than that. Yeah, totally. Dave, first of all, thank you. Everyone should check out The Other Side Academy and anywhere else we should point people towards. Uh, the Other Side Academy, either in Salt Lake City or Denver. We've got two facilities up and running now. Uh, we're right in the heart of Denver and we just bought a new property there. And we've got our, 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 our headquarters here in Salt Lake. And it looks like if things continue to move forward, that San Diego will be site three in the very near future. I figure... Mm -hmm. You know, in the next few days, we're going to decide whether or not we're going to acquire that property. And if so, I think inside of a year, we'll have site three opened in San Diego. Don't cool. quote me. Well, it's, it's looking like San Diego. <laughs> Very cool. And congratulations on everything you've done. Thank you for the inspiration. Everyone check out the Other Side Academy. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out. If you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand